And so, with that said, um, I'd like you all to sing with me. Could you all please stand once again? I know. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the City Youth Council of Toronto for the 2012-2014 term. Please be seated. Moving, <laughs> moving along with uh, our agenda, I'd like to invite uh, Nasma to the podium to introduce our special guest. Hi everyone. So we have an amazing guest speaker today, City Councillor Shelley Carroll from Ward 33. So round of applause for Shelley Carroll. Thank you. Uh, really dangerous thing. I, I generally, well Jessica is sitting in my seat. I generally sit over there and uh, we could be deciding uh, a decision worth $10.2 billion and I only get five minutes to speak about it. Tyler sent me an email and said, can you speak for a half an hour? <laughs> oh boy, I have nine years of pent up stuff. We're going to go through it all. <laughs> Bear with me. No, I, <laughs> I won't cover it all. But we do only have five minutes to speak. And, and so it seems as if it's all very uh, uh, superficial, but you're going to learn that before you're here and you're speaking for a few minutes on an issue, there's a month of, of the, the uh, extra long deliberation over things. There's a year talking about what it is we should be talking about, prioritizing and, and networking, making sure you're being reflective, bringing back uh, uh, the word of the youth in your area. All of that comes before the five minutes. And so uh, uh, by the time you're, you're, you're doing, you've done enough work that you should really be able to put a fine point on it in five minutes. Uh, we used to be able to say, this one's important, I need an extension of two minutes, but uh, that has been cancelled. So I'm, uh, I, I'm uh, uh, learning how to, 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 to work in an environment where you can't even have an extension if it's the biggest, most important thing that will ever happen in your ward. It's a rigorous uh, uh, discipline, but compared with other uh, youth groups, that's what this one is about. It's about structure. It's about being procedural. and. Uh, uh, I think it will. Uh, I think it will be a model for us. We had an interesting council session at just uh, uh, the beginning of this month. We're calling this a blue moon month because we had council in the first week of October. Just the way things worked out, uh, we're meeting again this week, starting on the 30th of October. And our chief financial officer was retiring. Um, sitting in that chair, Jessica, and, and I don't know, you probably, if you open the little cupboard, you won't find any more Kleenex, because I cried like a baby and behaved badly. I was so sad that he was retiring. Uh, wonderful person, and a person who got us through the global financial crisis, essentially, uh, where, where deficits tripled and quadrupled in other orders of government. By law, we can't run one. Uh, so we, we simply decided we weren't going home until we, until we got through it. And so for the first budget that came after what we now, because we were so mired in it, we just called it the GFC around here. Remember the GFC? Uh, you can sound like an economist and use that term from now on. And what it means is October 2008, global financial crisis. Uh, well, the first budget after the GFC, uh, we had already spent four months uh, forming uh, what we thought was another budget for an economic boom. <laughs> and then there was an economic crash. Uh, that CFO didn't go home for 72 hours when we got to the end and, uh, and, and we were still a little over 100 million off. He didn't go home for 72 hours. Uh, much to some of our consternation, he didn't shave in that 72 hours even. So that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, but we got it balanced up there so he knows about the hard work. And when he gave his retirement speech at the beginning of this week, he, uh, he spoke from the heart. He, he told us why he was retiring. Uh, for once laid to rest. When politicians and, and senior public servants say they're leaving because of family, it's usually true. The media likes to say, I wonder what the real reason is. It's usually really family. And, uh, uh, and he got through that story and then he said, now to you. And he said, I'm going to watch from home. Um, but I've got to tell you, counsel, just one thing. You need to be nice to each other. 
you need to be nice to each other. I've been watching this group form. I've been watching you uh, as a group buy into the structure, not rail at the structure, uh, invest in it, sign service agreements, agree to that service, take seriously what you're signing, and I am hoping that you can model for us what it means to be nice to each other. Um, I think that the youth in the City of Toronto are best placed to do that right now, to focus us in. You have the most to gain from council beginning to be nice to each other. You still have different politics, but we could get back to that type of political dynamic that says uh, uh, we could be political polar opposites, we can still be colleagues, colleagues can debate, we can finish this debate over lunch. I don't have to go for lunch with just the people who have exactly the same politics as me. I might learn something and I might help the body get to consensus by eating lunch with someone who is my political polar opposite or someone who's in the middle if I'm at an extreme. Um, there is, there is uh, work that can be done towards consensus by any member of this council. And, and so I think you will. Um, a, uh, a tweet that came in, I, I, I didn't even get a chance to finish it. I don't know if I even pressed send. A tweet that came in literally as I was uh, waiting to be introduced said, so councillor, uh, uh, tell us right now, how will we get from 44 councillors down to 22? You're going to find out why we can't. Um, the reason there are as many councillors as there are here now, and, and I hope that every space is filled in your by-election, um, is because there is that amount of work to do and there is a level of transparency that is absolutely necessary. We could move to 22 councillors tomorrow if you like, but what it means is that, is that a, a, a whole very deep layer of transparency disappears as we shut down all of the subcommittees that can't be populated with elected human resources. There needs to be elected human resources in hundreds of bodies in this building and around the city, all the way up to hospital boards, um, student nutrition. You think that's a school thing, but we put a third of the funding in. A counselor has to be there, and it's off-site. Uh, there have to be, there are 11 counselors that decide things in each of the four community counselors because what you want is, is people who understand this local area as we decide development, but there needs to be a good range of opinion there. We can have four counselors decide what happens in my ward, but I want 11 counselors to decide whether or not I've done a good job with community planners and with developers in a, in a stretch as tiny as the stretch from Don Valley Parkway to Victoria Park. Those of you who are in the East End know that piece of geography because it's, it's a conduit to the parkway. Everyone knows it. There will be, in the space of 12 years, 20,000 new residents living in a place that was gas stations and Tim Hortons between Don Valley Parkway and Victoria Park. And that's the provincial places to go policy. That happens whether I want it to or not. So I got to do a good job of it. I got to cover all the needs. I got to mitigate the impact on all the people who live there already. I got to do a lot of work. I got to jump up and down and demand that I have the best landscape designers and, and architects in the country, or you're going to decimate this, this part of town that is so important to, to the uh, Shepherd Transit plans. And I want 11 people in North York to be the filter to, that decides whether or not I got it right. And you will find that that happens in this council too. Geographical representation is so important, but it needs to be rich and full-bodied. Etobicoke, uh, think of the expanse of Etobicoke. Think of West Community Council, that whole Humber River, River region all the way up to Woodbine, whatever it's going to be. It's not really live right now. Woodbine, great open field with nothing happening on it, but, but we, we like to call it Woodbine. We have all, the, all of that and everything down to the lakeshore. It's about the size of France. I want 11 councillors to decide how we fill in all of that expanse. I want them to get it right. And so you need a rich, geographically representative uh, uh, body to do that. And here's what happens when you go geographical. 
You don't have to worry anymore about, oh, but who populated it? Is it special interest? Is it whatever? A coincidental thing happens because of, of what Toronto is. If you go geographical in your representational model in the city of Toronto, the diversity can just happen because it's there. We didn't put it all in one pocket of the city. We didn't put all one income in one pocket of the city. The richest place in Canada, Rosedale, is right beside Jamestown. And they're part of the same political representational area. And they have to decide things together. That's Toronto. So if you go geographical, you're going to get that richness of opinion that you're looking for. We debate things, heaven knows, in this council. Um, but we come to a lot of consensus because we have those commonalities, that we all have a range of incomes and a range of, of uh, ethnic diversities in our ward. So an interesting thing happens when we come into this council chamber. When we come in here once a month, we generally come in with about 350 items. Uh, 350 items that we've all got to, to ratify. We've done lots of work on them in committees and we've amended and some of us didn't like the amendments so we ran outside and we talked to a reporter and we thumped our chests. But by the time we get here at the end of the month there's 350 items. The first 150 every time, 150 of the, those items pass unanimously in the first half hour of council. That's not dysfunction. That's getting your work done and knowing that you can trust those items because a broad number of people looked at them out in community councils, a broad number of councillors, seven or eight councils worked them through in standing committees and, and they didn't erupt in the newspapers, I didn't hear from my community, I trust the work of my colleagues. And so 150 items because of the richness of that model. 150 items gone, half an hour, done. I trust my colleagues. Some of the most conservative ones. I trust them, even though that's not my political last stance. Because they all work together on, on some of those small small items. Now, what, what happens with the rest of them? Well, uh, so 150 of the 350 are gone. Um, there's another 100 there that we really just held because we're, we're trying to make the public service sweat. We didn't get uh, one or two things in this item or that item from a staff member. And the staff members poke their heads up. They sit in that section and that section. And they go, she held my item. Oh my god, what's wrong? It was supposed to go through. I want to go back to my office. And so uh, you watch on TV, there's this flurry of noise and carrying on in the council chamber just after we've gone through the agenda and figuring out uh, which of the, or the 150 we can just dismiss right away. That's not really because we're, we're not paying attention, it's because staff are running at us from all directions saying, why did you hold that? And, and so what happens is by lunchtime on the first day, the next hundred items are gone. Because you didn't do this, because you didn't do that. I'm going to technically have a problem with this, that, or the other thing. And, and then you'll see us stand up at lunch and on a technical amendment, they're gone. That's working with the public service, getting it done. Uh, not holding it and standing up and thumping my chest and making a speech because I don't need to embarrass the public service to get their best work. That's a dialogue that's going on in the city right now and you need to pay attention to it because your experience here in the City Youth Council will make some of you politicians. Many of you though, it will make public servants. You will learn what it means to serve community and you will learn all the ways to serve community. So some of you will become public servants. So youth need to decide on that issue. How do you work with the staff who get the work done after we've made the policy? Uh, I think I can go offline and I can talk to a staff member and I can get his best work without humiliating him. And I am not going to fire someone just because they disagree with me, if the reasons they disagree with me are credible. And in this, what it takes to get to work in this municipality, working your way up through smaller municipalities, working your way up to the point where you can handle a division that's inside a $10 billion budget, most of them, if they're disagreeing with the council, their reasons are very, very credible. So, so you'll, you'll learn some of those things, and those are things that you can weigh in on. So now, I've worked out those 100 issues, so now 250 of the 350 items are gone. 
Um, I can get rid of another 50 quickly and be down to just the 50 that we really argue about and the 20 that you read about in the paper. Another 50 are just, I had it all sorted out. I went to a committee and a counselor who was just making mischief or who hadn't read the report yet and then went ahead and made an amendment, uh, uh, messed it up for me back in a committee. Uh, I need him to change it back again. And those are gone by the end of the first day. And now we're down to, out of 350 big pieces of business that we do in a month, there's about 50 left that we really have to debate. You need a fullness of debate, and you need the debate to come from across different ranges of interest in the city. And it may be something that's so big it took until now to do it. Um, in that 50, there's always about 20 of them that are things that we're seeing for the first time in council session because they came from staff. They're, they're, they're new and emerging business. But we just need to decide what places those are going to go to and, and whether or not it's a, it's a priority for us. That's the type of work that we do, but we do it in a very flamboyant way. And sometimes we are not nice to each other in this room. I would really like to change that dynamic. It's possible to do it. Uh, if you go to Queen's Park, there's heckling in, in Queen's Park. We don't allow that here. You're not allowed to just sit there and scream at somebody while they're speaking. If you go over to Queen's Park and you really listen to it, it's interesting. Um, uh, unless things go horribly awry, uh, the heckling is often not super ugly. It's just uh, uh, we haven't built in my five minutes, so I'm just going to use my five minutes while you're having five minutes. Their system is too rigid, and since you know you're not going to have the floor because of the structure of today's uh, uh, Queen's Park uh, uh, period, you just scream while the other person is discussing your issue and, and hope some reporter says, hey, that was interesting. I must remember to scrum that guy afterwards. What he was saying kind of was a, a great counterpoint. My article will be written if I go scrum that guy later. So that heckling is really just media strategy. Uh, um, and, and so we, we've made it here at the municipal level, because what we do is so direct. It's not deciding where funds go, it's deciding actual services and how they happen and what gets built and where. Uh, we don't have that kind of uh, restriction. In any meeting, if we're meeting here as a council, you can have your five minutes on any issue, uh, any time. Uh, sadly, you get that five minutes whether you've read the report or not, and that gets interesting. Uh, uh, that, that's where we get cranky with each other. but. Sometimes you can have an instinct about something, even if you didn't have time and that wasn't the thing you were uh, 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 slaving over all month. So those are all, those are all things that will become a part of the dynamic of your work plan. But I want to talk to you just quickly about what I think could be the future. And I think it's only fair that I talk to you about it, because I spent about 15 minutes talking to the CBC French about it. And uh, it, it could end up on CBC English or whatever. Uh, I think that you could be the future of uh, something that, that uh, um, uh, people are very nervous about, but is going to wash over Toronto like a wave whether we want it to or not. I visited uh, uh, New York last, uh, well, Brooklyn to be more specific, uh, last year uh, to watch four councillors do uh, real participatory budgeting. Uh, and I mean real because I mean real money on the table. We have tried to do that in the Toronto Community Housing Corporation, but the rules of incorporation there are such that we let the tenants ha say, here's a pot of money and we want you to vote on it and we want you to decide on it, but it still goes back to the board. And the citizen and, and, and cancer accommodation board had to ratify what they said and, uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, had too much leeway to do amendments and push things out to different times and schedule. So we're not all the way there yet. In New York, in one ward in Chicago, um, what they did was take real money, million and a half dollars in each ward, and say, you're going to spend it. Over the process of the next few months, we're going to, uh, uh, you're going to bring forward projects. Uh, what is it you think should be done in this ward? The counselor threw out a couple that were sort of on her wish list or his wish list. Uh, and, uh, and then the community brought forward some of theirs. Uh, then they brought in staff to help them cost it, to understand the real cost of it, why it costs as much as it does, and why it could be done in this year and not that year. And then finally created a ballot when they narrowed it down to about uh, 50 or 60 projects in each ward. And then the citizens walked in the door and voted on it. 
And here's the exciting part for Toronto. It's not Municipal Elections Act time here. You're not voting on people. You're voting on money. So you don't need the Municipal Elections Act, which means everyone votes. You've got a fixed address, you vote, citizenship or not. Disproportionately, people who are not citizens in the city of Toronto are tenants, which means they pay more property taxes than any of us who live in single-family dwellings. On a per square inch basis, they are overrepresented in the property tax pot and underrepresented in the decision making around how we're going to spend that money. Participatory budgeting brings them back in and allows them to vote directly on projects. Some of you are wondering about that. We'll have the money talk one day. Uh, uh, at the, the time of amalgamation, uh, don't ask me why, but we, 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 we uh, narrowed and, and eliminated a number of tax classes in the way we figure out property tax and said that let's put multi-residential apartments and condos over here with commercial and industrial. And we decided that they should pay property tax at a ratio of four to one to single family dwellings. So you may ask why your landlord has to charge you so much rent. I would submit because he's got a very big property tax bill to pay. Interesting thing is though we're lowering that now. Uh, we started that in the bad old days of a terrible previous administration to lower that, to get it down to where you would be paying at a ratio of two to ha two and a half to one. But you'll still be paying more. If you're living in a really high rent apartment on a per square inch basis, you're probably paying more property tax than the richest man in this city. Whomever it is, I'm assuming it's a man, that's just me. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you probably on a per square inch basis, you're paying more property tax than him. If he lives in a mansion in Rosedale if you live in a high rent apartment building. So we want you to decide how to, to, to do the money. And here's the youth piece. Here's why I'm so excited about a strong, structured and procedural youth group that is geographically representative. If we begin to do this in Toronto, I think we gotta follow their lead. What they found is, let's let non-residents come in and learn more about the city uh, and, and, and have more of a say in things. But the other thing that happened was this. They learned very quickly from Alderman Joe Moore in Chicago, if you really want to have a good dialogue, lower the voting age to 16. He's been doing this, yeah. You don't have to ask the Premier to do that, because this isn't the Municipal Elections Act. This is just deciding about the money. And, and so, uh, so we lowered the voting age to, to 16. And here's what he found last year. The first time that they, they were having, when they were having the election where they elected a new mayor, Rahm Emanuel, uh, in Joe Moore's ward, 18-year-olds who could vote, voted in surprising numbers. Because they had been voting on how money gets spent for two years. And they knew the value of a vote. And there's a safe way to do it, and we don't have to lose our minds about lowering the voting age, because this is not voting on the, the, the uh, politician. This is just building the capacity to understand the finances of this city. And what kind of person will you be later when you're owning a business, when you are voting for politicians, when you're voting for councillors and mayors and, and, and raising families? What sort of voter will you be then if you have a real capacity to understand it? Uh, and so participatory budgeting allows us to do this, but you get a payoff with it. It has to be real money and you spend it. And so that's what happened. And here's, here's what's happened. They went around, they did some surveying and some polling afterwards. Uh, there's lots of money to do that in, in, the, in the American large cities because their, their city halls are run on party systems and, and the parties pour obscene amounts of money into polling, which is a downside of it, I think. You don't want to govern by polling. But they wanted to know the impact that this was having. And the, the results were compelling enough that where four councillors did this in, in New York City last year, uh, three Democrats and one Republican, uh, this spring there will be eight councillors doing this in, in New York City, five of them Democrats and three of them Republicans. In Chicago, uh, uh, Joe Moore did this uh, uh, all by himself. Uh, he's going into his fourth process. And, uh, and this year, eight aldermen will be joining him. Uh, so there will be nine people doing this in Chicago. 
And we have the ability to do this in Toronto. There's about a million dollars get spent in every ward here in the city of Toronto now, but it's, it's not at all transparent. It's sometimes not even transparent to the councillors. It doesn't come to us in any discretionary way. It's all out in global budgets. And so it's, it's really hard to pinpoint, but it does get spent in each ward. But because you can't see it, one of the ways in which some of my colleagues will manipulate people into thinking they need me and me alone as your savior is by saying we're getting short shrift. Without me, Scarborough never gets any money spent on it. Without me, the downtown will spend all the money. Without me, downtown is going to fall apart because the suburbs are being so demanding. Those types of messaging uh, 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 points, well, they're not true. I can tell you because I was the budget chief for four years and equity is one of our lenses. Uh, sometimes we fail, but it's all, there's always that attempt. Um, you can still get away with that messaging because you can't see it in our books. If we do this discretionary ward by ward participatory budgeting, you'll learn so much more about the whole $10 billion whack you will become a big part of understanding why the real argument in transit is, is being missed entirely. We need to be honest about funding transit, funding transit, because you can build whatever you like. Today, in the existing system, we don't have enough money to operate. It's why the bathroom's filthy, it's why the station's dirty, it's why there are the, the vehicles are all bunched up and, and things go kablooey far too often. So we don't even have enough money to operate it today. That's why the most important conversation, and one you might want to listen to or, or web stream, uh, we're going to talk about funding that in council this week. And it's one of those big conversations that we'll have it, but it won't go away. We'll have to keep revisiting it. And so it's something that, because the, the end result will be to go out and consult on the list of options. It's something that you can engage in as a city council a city youth council for the whole next year. But I ask you to remember this. The TTC chair has said this. I agree with her. Be very careful to remember there, there are two words that you hear uh, used interchangeably, and they shouldn't be because they're two quite different things. There's funding something, and there's financing something. When someone says the private sector will pay, that's code for the private sector will build a whole bunch of tall buildings whether you want them or not. And uh, they might give us some money up front, but they will always, always, always expect to be paid back. That's financing. Funding is where we decide as a society how we're going to raise the cash to get a thing done and not have to pay somebody back into the generation so that our grandchildren are still paying for it. There's funding a thing, and we do that together, and there's financing a thing. Find a private sector partner, they'll give us the money up front, but we gotta pay him back. Um, we're going to decide how to fund transit. It's already, it's already a fight, here's my crystal ball. The first fight is going to be that in a committee, someone added to the, to the list of ways to fund it. There's sales tax, and payroll tax, and toll road tax, all of those ways of funding. Someone added to the list uh, public-private partnerships, P3s. That is not funding. That is financing. We can bring in a private sector partner. They will want to be paid back in cash, in units of profit-making condominiums, or, uh, uh, choose your poison. That's financing. And so we're going to have a debate about that. And then we're going to send it out into the public. One of the key roles that the City Youth Council will be able to play in this very coming year, 2013, is to go out and begin a dialogue that's youth to youth to make sure that they can Thank you so much, Councillor Shelley Carroll, for those uh, inspiring words. Uh, at this time, uh, this council stands, stands in recess until 12.30 p.m. Um, oh, sorry, uh, just something to note uh, for councillors. I know um, the way you, uh, the seating's been assigned now is uh, councillor one, two, three, four, and just going uh, in that order. Um, there will be a recess later on in the day 
um, in terms of uh, the executive committee meeting uh, to um, uh, form the membership on the different standing committees and other committees of the of council. At that time, uh, you can choose uh, sort of where you want to sit in the council chamber, and we'll have a blank seating plan here for you to choose that if you want to sit beside certain people or whatever the case may be, and then that will take effect for the next council meeting and those meetings, uh, those meetings going forward. Thank you.